All right, amen, amen. All right, the, uh, thank you, brother. The, uh, the background to what we're going to read this morning is a um, change of administration. David is uh, becoming king in Israel after the disastrous reign of Saul. Saul was a man of the flesh. Saul was a man who could not take instruction. That was the first king of Israel. He could not take instruction from God. He did not have a heart for God. And he not only was a real man, a real individual, an historical figure, but he's a type, a picture. What does he represent? He represents everything that's bad about the flesh and everything that's bad about allowing the flesh to reign. You want to see the outcome of allowing the flesh, and when I talk about flesh, I'm talking about everything done in your own human natural ability. Many, many churches today operate simply on human wisdom, human planning, human finances, human everything. God could be far, far away. God could be on the outside knocking at the door trying to get in. It just gonna, it's going to go on without God. That's Saul. Saul is the representative uh, picture, the prototype of that kind of man, that kind of ministry. And obviously God was displeased with him and God killed him. Just for the same reason that your physical body isn't going to heaven. It's going to die and the Lord's going to leave it behind. So Saul died, got left behind, and then the new guy, a man after God's own heart, David, who is in the Bible a picture of a spiritual man. Not a perfect man. He had his flaws. He sinned. But he's a picture of what you and I should be in this life, and that is somebody with a heart for God, somebody that has a love for the Word of God, and somebody that wants to do something for God, and is willing to take instruction from God. And so here in, our, in, our, in this passage of Scripture, there's, this is around the time when the administration is changing. Saul has just died. David is being made king. And uh, that's where we're going to jump in the middle of this story, all right? Chapter 11, verse 1. Then all Israel gathered themselves to David unto Hebron, saying, Behold, we are thy bone and thy flesh. And moreover, in time past, even when Saul was king, thou wast he that led us out and brought us in Israel. But, you know, the people knew Saul, David was their real leader. Saul was the guy with the crown on his head. He had, you know, he had the authority and he had whatever went with being a king. But David... Uh, was the real leader. He was the one that led them into battle and so on and so forth. And, and the people understood that. And now that Saul is gone, now finally they, they recognize David as the rightful king. Verse 3, Therefore came all the elders of Israel to the king, to Hebron, and David made a covenant with them in Hebron before the Lord, and they anointed David king over Israel according to the word of the Lord by Samuel. Now the next few verses describe David. Uh, building his capital. He took the city of Jerusalem. As soon as he was crowned king in Hebron, he went down to Jerusalem, took it away from the Jebusites, conquered it, and it became known to this day the city of David, all right, because David conquered it. He built his palace there, and, uh, and so David lived in uh, the city of David and uh, made that his capital. Now, in verse number 10, I want you to see uh, some of the people, the kind of people that gathered themselves around David. All right? Verse number 10. These also are the chief of the mighty men whom David had, who strengthened themselves with him and his kingdom and with all Israel to make him king, according to the word of the Lord concerning Israel. Now, I want you just to see some of these people. Now, their names get recorded. Their names are recorded in the word of God. That's, that's something. Boy, you get your name written down in the scriptures because <laughs> this book is eternal. I mean, I don't care what a guy did, a good or bad. You get your name written down in here, it's pretty important, you know. So, uh, and so their deeds, whether good or bad, are worthy of study. Worthy, you know, they're in here for our instruction so we could look at what they did or didn't do and learn something from it, right? And so look at the kind of men that gathered around David as their king. We know what David was like. David was, we already said he was a man after God's own heart. He was a poet, you know, he had, a, he had a soft side, I guess you could say. He wrote poetry. He wrote songs. He played an instrument. He sang. He was called the sweet psalmist of Israel. He was a shepherd. He had some kind of 
in his bones, in, within him, he had that desire to lead and to care for others. That's why the Bible calls pastors shepherds in the Bible. That, that has to be in a person. And David had that. David was a shepherd by nature from the time he was a kid. He was also a fighter from the time he was a kid. Man, he had some guts. We read in the Bible the story of where the sheep were under attack by a lion. David killed it with his own bare hands. Uh, it was under attack by a bear. David killed it with his own bare hands. That's why David wasn't afraid to go up against a Goliath. He had already proven that God could help a little kid when things he cared about, sheep in that case, were under attack. He'd already seen God enable him to defend them. And so now when the sheep of Israel are under attack by Goliath, David didn't hesitate. He'd already seen God. It's not that David was brash or arrogant. He had already seen God demonstrate his power to help a young man, a very young man, you know, less than 17 years old probably, defeat a lion with his bare hands and a bear. And so when Goliath came up, not a big deal. I, I know the God of Israel. He wasn't trusting his muscles or he wasn't even trusting his aim with that slingshot. He was trusting his God. All right. So David had that heart. He had the heart of a warrior in him. He had a gentle side, a singer side, a psalmist side, a shepherd side, but he also, he was also a fighter. He was a warrior. It's no wonder men were attracted to him. Men were drawn to him. Men would follow him into battle without fear because David himself was like that. David said, for by thee, I have run through a troop. Think about that for a second. It didn't say, by thee I have found a place of refuge behind a rock when the enemy was over there. No. When the enemy approached, what did David do? You know, like first responders here, you know, they didn't, weren't running that way. They ran toward the danger. David ran toward danger. That was in his nature. That, that, that inspires men. You know, if you had been a man back in Israel in those days, you would have wanted to follow David. If you had any red blood going through your body at all, you would have wanted to follow a man like that. David ran toward the problem. David ran. He says, by thee. But he didn't take it upon himself. He didn't credit himself. He said, Lord, by thee I have run through a troop. And by my God have I leaped over a wall. I, think about that. You know, the walls in Israel were not this high. They put walls around their property. They put walls around their houses. They put walls around their cities. David said, by my God. He, just said, he didn't say, by my athletic training. He says, by my God have I leaped over a wall. So David, you know, what was on the other side of the wall? The enemy. It was God, he said, that gave him strength. It was God that taught him to war. Look at, uh, turn with me for a second. I just want to, see, I want you to see for a second, because we know what Saul is a picture of, but what is David a picture of? David is a picture of the kind of a Christian you and I ought to be, the kind of a follower of God you ought to be, but he's also a picture of our Savior. Jesus Christ is called the Son of David. He sits in Jerusalem in the millennium on the throne of David, it's called. So there are many, many parallels. Both are shepherds, both are kings, both are warriors. Many parallels between Jesus Christ and David. So it's helpful just for a second to see a couple of these things about David uh, look at Psalm 18. Psalm 18. Let's go down to verse number um, 32. Psalm 18, verse 32. This is just, you know, a little introduction here. We'll get going in a second. Psalm 18, verse 32. Verse number, yeah, verse 32. It is God <clears throat> that girdeth me, you know, gir you know what a gird is, girdle, like, you know, it's a... Uh, you know, the guys at Home Depot wear them sometimes. You know, they'll put it around their waist to strengthen their back, hold, hold everything in when they have to lift and twist and things like that. And the uh, Bible talks about girding up your loins, you know, strengthening yourself. It's part of the Christian's armor in Ephesians chapter 6. And David said, It's God that girdeth me with strength and maketh my way perfect. He maketh my feet like hinds feet. You know, that, that was a kind of a deer, I believe, that would climb the rocks and the mountainsides, you know, in Israel and could leap from boulder to boulder. David said, the Lord has made me like that. 
He's made my arms strong. He's made my feet like hinds' feet and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war. Now, the Bible doesn't encourage you to be a warmonger or anything like that. The Bible doesn't encourage you to find some place. I mean, if my family was under threat and I had to defend my family, somebody probably is going to die if, I, if I'm capable. But the, the Lord doesn't glorify that for us. But when the Bible speaks about war, obviously in the Old Testament, there was a lot of warfare. There were nations going against nations, and they, they had to go out and defend their land and defend their families, and there was a lot of bloodshed. But it's not because God loves those things. Those were necessary times. That was necessary in those times. What's the spiritual application for you and I? You and I are also in a fight. Amen. It's a spiritual war. And you and I should not be afraid in this war. We should be war spiritual warriors, spiritual soldiers for Jesus Christ. David said, he teacheth, God taught me to war. Think about that. Make the spiritual application. You are up and I are up against spiritual enemies that will destroy you spiritually if possible. And you're told in the Bible to defend yourself, to prepare yourself. To resist that, to war against those. Paul said at the end of his life, I have fought a good fight. He told Timothy, war a good warfare. There's war. There's, there's spiritual enemies. There is something that has to be contended with. And David said, God taught me how to do this. He was instructed by God. He teacheth my hands to war. So that a bow of steel, they must have had steel bow and arrows, not wooden ones. You know, not, they didn't cut a branch down off a tree and make a bow and arrow. They make steel bows. It's crazy. We're talking about 3,000 years ago. So that a bow of steel is broken by my arms. So David was not only, he's got that gentle side, he's got that tender side, He's got that poetic side, you know. And he was a man like you and I. There were times when life overwhelmed him, right? David, you can read the Psalms. You can see David is he's so approachable. He's so understandable because he, you know, in some ways, he seems like us in a way, you know. He's often crying out to God for help. He's often overwhelmed by things. And even sometimes he, he wrote about his soul being in despair. And so he's human. He's relatable, but, but David had this side of him that when it was time to fight, David was ready to fight. Doesn't mean he went around all the time picking a fight, looking for a fight, but when it was time to fight, and it was necessary to fight, David knew how to fight and was ready to do it. Now, I am not talking about you and I enlisting or anything like that. We're not going to go there. We're not talking about, you know, get an arsenal, you know, fill your basement with guns. Don't let anybody go there. That's not what I'm talking about. This is all on a spiritual level. When it was time to war, David was taught and ready to do so. He would leap over a wall. He would run through a troop. In other words, in a time of war, David was on the offense, not on the defense. David wasn't looking for a place to hide. He wasn't trying to find a cabin in Montana. David looked at the problem, looked at the situation, and went toward it. No wonder men wanted to follow him. No, men, no wonder three guys would be willing to fight their way through the Philistine army to go down to Bethlehem and get him a glass of water. Why? Why? They, they knew the kind of a man he was. They knew the kind of thing that David understood, the danger of that, the sacrifice of that. David, more than anybody else, would have appreciated a sacrifice like that, and he did. He wouldn't even drink the water when they brought it back to him. He poured it out because he understood. These men hazarded their lives for me to get me something, a little glass of water that would, that would please me. It's the same attitude that you and I ought to have toward our commander, our Lord Jesus Christ who is just like that. That spirit that was in David is the spirit of Christ. He said, the spirit of the Lord spake by me. So the spirit of Jesus Christ 
inspired David when he wrote and motivated David when he fought. It was the Lord doing these things in him. He said, the Lord strengthened me. By my God I've done this. He taught me this. It was the Spirit of God. David is in many ways a man to be emulated because our Savior is a man to be emulated, and they're very, very similar. So anyway, here's this long list, and I was going to go through it all, and we don't have time because I really want to get to the end of this, but if you read down through here, let, let, uh, let's go back to 1 Chronicles chapter 11 real fast. And, and there's a lot of, well, we've talked about these before, David's mighty men, those, those guys are my heroes, I love reading about these guys, the things they did just boggle my mind. All of them were like their commander. They were, they were so much like Jesus Christ. By the way, you know that you spend a lot of time around Jesus Christ. Do you know what happens? You, get, you, you become like him. That's supposed to be a normal occurrence. You start to look at the world the way that Jesus Christ wants you to look at the world. The more these men were around David. Now, they weren't that way in the beginning. Remember when David first began to gather men unto himself in the cave of Adullam? They were just a bunch of discouraged misfits that came to him. But they spent month after month after month after month after month with David, and guess what they became? They became just like him. That's what happens. You spend enough time with Jesus Christ, you begin to be more like him. That's what these guys happen. Now, we're looking at them, and we're not glorifying their achievements or their character. I think this is completely due to their proximity to David. He inspired this in them. He inspired this in them. They're just ordinary guys. But he inspired this in them. Look at the things that some of these guys did. First Chronicles chapter 11. It says here, verse number 11, jo uh, Joshua Beam, verse 11, chapter 11, verse 11, Joshua Beam lifted up his spear against 300, slain by him at one time. I don't know. I'd like to just stop and try to process each one of these guys. But I mean, this stuff is mind boggling. With a spear. No nunchucks, you know, no cannon, no gun, a spear. Not even a sword, because sword cuts both ways. Spear, I think, would be even more difficult. How do you do that? That means you've got to stab every one of them. And I don't think they're lining up like in the Chinese kung fu movies, you know, where they're all lined up, you know, one at a time, and you just take them out one at a time. You've got 300 guys around you, and this guy is killing, he killed 300 of them with a spear. Look at the next one, verse 12, Eleazar. It says, verse 13, he was with David at Pasadim, and there the Philistines were gathered together to battle, and, to, and there was a parcel of ground full of barley. And the people fled, and they set themselves in the midst of that parcel, David and this guy, and delivered it, and slew the Philistines. Wow. Verse 15, now 15 down through 19, that's talking about those three that went down to Bethlehem and get him a, to get him a drink of water fought their way through the Philistine army, and then, of course, that would mean they had to fight their way back through the Philistine army to get back to David, just to bring him a glass of water, because he was just dreaming about his childhood. He grew up in Bethlehem, and he was remembering the well in Bethlehem and the taste of that water, and he probably didn't even mean to send anybody, you know, to put him at risk. He's just talking about that, and you know, talking about, oh, boy, boy, I can remember that. That's all it took. That's all it took was for these three guys just to hear that from David, and they got this idea to do this. David didn't send them down there just for something that might please him. Wouldn't it be great to be that way with Jesus Christ? Not to have him command you 14 times in letters six feet tall, but just you're reading between the lines in the Scripture, and you kind of get the idea of what would please him, and you just do that. Do you need a command? Do you need it spelled out in black and white? Those guys didn't. They put two and two together. David remembers that water. He'd love it. He's thinking about it. Let's go do it. Man, I tell you, that's somebody who knows their commander pretty well. Wouldn't it be wonderful if we had Christians like that? That don't have to have it spelled out for you, but you just fall in love with your Bible, fall in love with your Savior, and you can read between the lines and get the sense of what the Lord is pleased with, and you just do that. That's some growth. That's some maturity. That's the heart of a soldier. That's the heart of a soldier. And there's, oh boy, there's a bunch of them. We don't have time. There's verse 22. There's ben Beniah. Uh, I like, let's, let's look at him. Verse 22. The son of a valiant man. 
So he had a good daddy. He had some training. He had a good example. He was the son of a valiant man. But wow, look at what he did. Uh, he slew two lion-like men of Moab. I don't know what that means. Lion-like men. I don't know if that means they had bushy hair like a mane on a lion, or they, had, they were just ugly and had big teeth. I, who knows? I don't know what. Maybe they sharpened their teeth to be more, you know, whatever. I don't know what. I don't know what. But here are these two guys, probably aggressive, angry. Maybe they were growling when they came at him, you know. Shaggy guys, you know, muscle-bound guys, shaggy-haired guys, growling, screaming. This guy, I don't know, just went, no, they're, they're, they're down. They're gone. <coughs> Also, he went down and slew a lion. If that wasn't enough, two lion-like men and a lion in a pit. In a pit in a snowy day. I love the way the Lord puts those little details in there. Sl- killing a lion, that'd be difficult. All right, but now you and the lion are in a pit. That makes it more difficult. And it's snowing. <laughs> I was always like the Lord said, I'm going to let everybody know that too. It's like, I don't know, there's a sense of humor. God's got a sense of humor. You're not getting out of the pit. Either you or the lion are going to die. So he kills the lion in a pit on a snowy day. Wow. And verse 23, if that wasn't enough, that would have been enough to get your name in the book forever. He slew an Egyptian, a man of great stature, five cubits high. Figure that one out. Okay, so there's, what is that, seven and a half feet tall? Is that that right? Seven and a half feet tall? Who's seven and a half feet tall? We know anybody seven and a half feet tall? Some basketball players or something? Shaq. Shaq, seven and a half feet Okay, so here's an Egyptian, the size of Shaq, and in his hand was a great spear like a weaver's beam. This is a big wooden post. And he, that is this guy Benaiah, went down to him with a staff, a staff, that's a shepherd's staff, a stick. Here's a big tall guy, seven and a half feet tall with a spear in his hand, and you got a stick. Most guys would say, I need a good place to hide. <laughs> No, he just went right toward him, went down to him with a staff, plucked the spear out of his hand, <laughs> and slew him with his own spear. Wow. You know, an army like this, you don't need 10,000. You just need, you need a few good men. I mean, you need, you need some men like this around you. God has always seemed to work that way, too. God has always tried to narrow his army down to men like that. In the days of Gideon. Right? Originally, there were 30,000 people that showed up to fight when it was time for them to go out against the Midianites. God said, that's too many. He said, let everybody that's afraid go home. <laughs> and when the dust settled, 20,000 people were gone. Now you're down to 10,000. God said, that's still too many. Take them down to the water and have them get a drink out of the water and observe them, watch them the way they drink the water. And so Gideon did that, and he chose 300 men who didn't take their armor off when they got a drink of water out of the river. In other words, 300 men that were soldiers at heart, understood the danger, recognized, hey, the Midianites could come over that hill any minute. Maybe we should be ready to fight. And so Gideon, God said, take those 300. That's, that's all I need. I know Gideon might have been questioning God. The Midianites were thousands and thousands and thousands. And Lord, I, we've only got 300. God said, that's all I want. It's not the numbers. You know, I'll be with you, but you do have to have the right caliber of men. And David had a, the right caliber of men around him in a time of war. Right? And then it goes on. It lists, um, let's, uh, let's just skip ahead if we can. Let's go to chapter 12. It, it mentions some of them. Look at chapter 12, 1 Chronicles chapter 12. Now these are they that came to David to Ziglag when he yet kept himself close because of Saul, the son of Kish. So in other words, they're not joining up with David at this moment. They had already joined up with him before when he was still in Ziglag. You know, a lot of Christians are ready. Is it safe yet? Is it safe? Can we proceed? All right, I'll go. No, these were already with guys, the ones that we just read about, these were guys that had already joined up with David when it wasn't safe. When Saul was still king and David was running from cave to cave in hiding and trying to stay alive and keep his men alive, So they had fought these battles when David was still a rejected king. When David was not received by the people yet. 
kind of like the Lord Jesus Christ right now. He's the rightful king, but he's rejected by this world. You know, it's one thing. If you think that later, when he's triumphant, that you get to reign with him, is it safe now? You've already wiped out all the enemies. Can I enlist? No. We're supposed to be with him right now. We're supposed to be serving with him right now. These guys didn't get in when the getting was good. These guys got in when it was not wise to be a part of whatever David was involved in because he was being hunted by the government. He was being hunted by Saul, who had already tried to kill him twice. And these men just went wherever David went. If David went there, they went with him. If David decided we're going to go over there, then they went with him. They didn't have any particular strategy except stay close to David. (laughs) Is any of this starting to hit a nerve with you anywhere? We don't have any particular strategy here. Our strategy is stay close to Jesus. <laughs> Let's just stay close to him. Amen. We're going to be safe there. Right. We're going to learn some things there. But he does want the right caliber, the right kind of people around him. doesn't mean that his arms aren't open to accept everybody. I mean, just because you didn't fight with David didn't mean you were not a part of his kingdom. But obviously, these men are remembered. These men received glory. These men were rewarded. Not everybody's names are mentioned in the Bible. I mean, some are singled out for mention because of something. They did something. You and I are going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ one day, and the Lord is not just passing out participation trophies. He's passing out rewards for those that have suffered with Him, that have endured some things with Him that have faced some things with him, that have stayed close to our commander in difficult times. That's what we're facing. It's, it, First Bible Church has got to stay close to our commander. And you men especially have got to keep yourself close and keep your families close to Jesus Christ. And notice what it says about him. Verse 2, chapter 12, verse 2. They were armed with bows and can use both the right hand and the left in hurling stones and shooting arrows out of a bow, even of Saul's brethren of Benjamin. In other words, you naturally have some, you favor the right or the left. And if you can do something equally well with right and left, it means that you trained and trained and trained and trained. So in other words, here were men that not just relying on natural ability, There's some effort. There's some, "Mm, I can do more. I can do better. God can help me to do more. God can help me to do better. Right? Right and left. That's not normal. That's not natural. That's not just the flesh. That's something extra. These are men that were around David. Men that weren't willing to just coast. Men that went a little extra, went a little further, did a little bit more. For his glory, for his sake, for David's sake, we should be willing to do the same for our king, for our commander. He went, he went a lot further for you. Drop down to verse 8. And of the Gadites, there separated themselves unto David into the hold to the wilderness. This is, before, this is before Hebron. This is talking about the past. Men of might and men of war fit for the battle. Fit for the battle. (laughs) Fit. And it's not talking about, I mean, obviously here, it's physical fitness. It's mental fitness. It's mental readiness. It's courage in their heart. But the spiritual application, of course, is you, you and I are meant to be fit. We have to be fit for this battle that you and I are in. Fit. Most Christians today just want to sing and dance. Typical Christian service. Just a lot of music and entertainment. There's no preparation for battle. There's no preparation for spiritual warfare. There's no understanding of spiritual warfare. It's just, I want to feel good. I want to feel good about myself. I want you to say something nice about me. I don't know if any of you have ever been in the military. You know, I don't think they spend boot camp telling you nice things about you. 
you know what? I love the way you made your bed this morning. You know, it's really good. You're not going to hear anything positive at all. Even if you do something right, you're probably not going to be commended for it. You're not going to be patted on the back. You're not going to be, uh, you know, appreciated. You're going to be, you're going to be abused. Most likely, if, you know, I don't know, the modern military today, it probably is all, you know, soft and, but that's probably why, God help us, if we ever actually get into a real full-scale World War III, which looks like it's coming, God help us, because our reliance is on technology. That's dangerous, boy. That's really dangerous. In the past, without technology, we had guys that would just run into bullets, just run into machine guns. Whew, we had men like David in the past wars. I don't know. We got. I don't know. We got too many of those today. We got a few, but well, it's dangerous. It's really dangerous. But these were men that were fit for battle, that could handle shield and buckler, whose faces were like the faces of lions, and were as swift as the rose upon the mountains. Fit and swift. Think about the spiritual applications here to yourself. I think many Christians spiritually are fat, slow, and lazy. Not fit and swift spiritually. Not ready for anything. If the washing machine breaks down, they, 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 they bust a gasket. Not ready for anything, not ready for any heartache, not ready for any trouble, not ready for any spiritual opposition whatsoever. Not fit for battle, not fit. Let's go and skip down a little bit further. It says, look at verse 23. Well, by the way, I oh, know we don't have time. Verse 23. And these are the numbers of the bands that were ready armed ready armed to the war and came to David to Hebron for what purpose? To turn the kingdom of Saul to him according to the word of the Lord. In other words, they fought for David. They fought for him. They fought for his kingdom. They fought for his glory. David would get all the glory. They might get an honorable mention. But they're fighting for their king. They're serving for His glory, for His kingdom. And so the Bible says you and I are supposed to be doing. You have, all, after all, been translated into the kingdom of His dear Son. You're part of a kingdom. I know we're part of the body of Christ, but also there is, a, there is one small kingdom aspect to this. We are a part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And we should understand that everything that we do should be for His glory. Look at verse 24. Um, and starting in verse number 24, we, don't, we won't take the time, but it lists all the tribes. Tribe of Judah in verse 25, a tribe of Simeon in verse, 20, uh, verse 24 is Judah, 25 is Simeon. Chapter 26 uh, is the tribe of Levi in verse 29, 3,000 from the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, chapter 30, 20,000 men from the tribe of Ephraim. Uh, chapter 31, 18,000 men from the tribe of Manasseh. Uh, verse 32, Issachar. Verse 33, Zebulon. Um, look at verse, oh, look at those guys. Verse 33, such as went forth to battle. Expert in war. With all instruments of war. 50,000. Which could keep rank. That's interesting. Nobody was trying to showboat. Nobody was trying to get the limelight. Nobody was trying to... I mean, they could keep rank. In other words, they fought as a team. Amen. They served as a group. Amen. They understood that in war, no army sends the men it's trained just to go out and do 100,000 individual efforts. The fight is a unit. You know the plan. You have a strategy. You understand your part in that plan. You, you, you labor and you serve and you fight alongside your brothers and sisters. That's the way a church is supposed to function. Nobody in here needs to get any glory for any reason, anything at all. We're all just tiny little cogs in this, in this thing that the Lord is doing. And as long as He's the King and He has the preeminence and He gets the glory, then He is pleased to bless us with all that we need for this, for this battle. As long as He gets the glory, He has the right to it. 
And so they knew how to keep rank. They knew how to fight as a team. They knew how to stay together. Some people in this church don't know how to stay together. We could sit down and strategize and think and pray and plan some things. There's always going to be one. Well, I don't think we should do it that way. Nobody consulted me on this. Well, I don't know about that. Hey, this isn't about you or me. We're part of this together. This is supposed to be a family. This is supposed to be an army. I was watching something the other night with Margaret. I think it was Band of Brothers. Uh, she loves that. I think she's seen it about four times. And I know there's some parts in there we have to fast forward. But I just remember one part that I saw. And uh, there was some guy in the unit, and maybe you remember his name, because I, don't, I don't, can't remember his name, but he was, he was afraid. He was terrified. And he wanted, to hide the one, hide, he wanted to hide behind the haystack. I forget they were going into one of those towns. And they realized they got to get that guy out. Because that's, that fear, that attitude infects everybody else. In time of war, that sort of thing can actually be caused to be executed. When somebody's fear infects others, in a time of war, commanders are, are allowed to remove the problem in whatever means they feel are right. I'm not suggesting anything, but that's the importance that when, that's what it's talking about, they understood how to keep rank, fight as a team, serve together, be a part of, be a part collectively of others, rather than you just being the lone ranger and you go doing your thing. By, you know, one bad attitude in this place, one, one guy with a chip on his shoulder, or one woman with a, a burr in her saddle, or whatever, I said something else. <laughs> Looking for some opportunity to find some allies to your point of view. Well, I don't, you know. I'll tell you what, in a time of war, you'd be executed. Why? Because that affects the entire church. You say, does God really feel that way? Anybody remember what he did to Ananias and Sapphira? That spirit of lying that they brought into that church, the Lord just killed them both on the spot. I'm not saying God still does that sort of thing. Although... Sometimes I would look, wish, but anyway. But, uh, <clears throat> but I'm just saying, the importance, how important is this to the Lord? It's pretty important. That's what all these examples in the Bible are there for. For you and I to get the principle, to understand that you are not as important as what God is trying to do with us collectively. Yes, you're important. Yes, God loves you. Yes, every little hair on your head is numbered and he cares about every little problem. But when it comes to the work of the Lord, when it comes to the endeavors that have been given us to carry out, now we have to move differently. We have to act differently. We have to work cooperatively. We have to do it together. It's dangerous not to do it together. Look at... Um, well, let's, let's skip. I, was going to, I just want to go back. Here, here's, all right, here's the message. The message starts here, verse 32. Here's what I want to talk about this morning. Verse number 32. Out of all these people that came, 50,000 from this tribe, 30,000 from that tribe, 18,000 from this one, this one, this one, this one. Notice what it says about the tribe of Issachar, verse 32. And the children of Issachar, that's a tribe, one of the tribes in Israel, which were men that had understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do. In other words, they knew, they understood the gravity of those days that they were living in. They understood, these are really bad times, these are dangerous times. They understood what was going on around them. They weren't oblivious to what was happening. They understood. They didn't just know the facts. They understood what was going on. They understood the times. Why was that understanding so important? Because you need, like, you need men like that in order to know what to do. To know what to do in times like that. You know what First Bible Church needs? We need a bunch of men like those from Issachar. 
with understanding of the times to know what to do, to know what your family should do, to know what you should do. There's a lot of guys today that don't have a clue. They don't even understand all of these events that you can see day after day, moment after moment, on the news, they can't connect the dots. They don't know what it all means. They don't understand these things are all indications of where we are in time. And if I could understand these times, I would know exactly what I should do. I'd know what my family should do. I would know what my priorities should be at a time like this. We would know what First Bible Church should do at a time like this. If we're ignorant of what's going on around us and, and fail to connect the dots, we're going to waste our time, waste our money, shoot ourselves in the foot, and maybe fall out along the way. David wanted men like this around him. Men that understood the times, that would know what to do. Because I think sometimes David didn't even know what to do. He had to pray, Lord, what do you want us to do? Do you want us to go up against them now or wait? Do you want us to go this way or do you want... God, David was always asking the Lord. It's good to have men around you that understand the times. To know what to do. Oh, yeah, thank God we got, we got some here in this place. I'm talking about me. I'm, there are men here that know what's going on. But I mean, as a whole, as a church, this needs to be true of all of us. Men that have understanding of the times to know what to do. I guess, I don't know what the title for this would be, but maybe, do you know what's going on? <laughs> and do you know what you should do? Do you know what's going on? Because <laughs> if you don't, then I guarantee you, you don't know what to do. Let's go a little bit further if we can. Turn your Bible. I want to give you a few thoughts here. Let's see if we can understand the times. Now the times in 1 Chronicles chapter 11, the men of Issachar understood exactly what was going on. And they knew how to respond to it. They knew what Israel should do. Well, we're not living in those times. We're living in our times. And we should understand what's happening right now around us. War is imminent. It certainly seems that way. We have three aircraft carriers and all the ships in those battle groups connected to that in the Middle East. China has sent... Similar forces, Iran obviously has all of their proxies around Israel, hundreds of thousands of soldiers on the border, and uh, we've got, Ukraine hasn't gone away, China and Taiwan, that issue hasn't gone away. It's like everything right now in the world is like just ready to explode, and it, all it needs is just one event, one event to just set the whole thing in motion. And I think already, I think, and every man in our church and other brothers that I've talked to agree that we are right now past the point of any return. Nothing's going back. You can't put this thing back in the box. All right? So we've already passed a point where to go back to anything that you and I once knew was normal in life, it's not going to happen. Things have now started rolling too fast. So do we as a church understand the times and do we know what we should do? Do we know what we should do? So that's the message this morning. I want to talk about the times and what we should do. First of all, let's discuss the times. All right, real fast. And I, none of this is going to be new because you, I know you read your Bible. Go to uh, Revelation chapter 3 real fast. Let's look at the times. Revelation chapter 3. Revelation chapter 3, look at verse number um, 14. And unto the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know thy works. 
Now, the Lord is writing to a church, a real congregation, but again, Revelation is a book of prophecy. These are prophetic. This was written 2,000 years ago when John was looking ahead to the entire church age unfolding in front of him, looking up until our day right now. Seven churches are spoken of here. The first church, the church of Ephesus, would have been the church that was there on the earth. In other words, that body of believers that was there on the earth in John's day. Well, then if you go all the way to the end, the last church of Laodicea would be the, would be the state of Christianity in our day. All right? That's logical. Christianity in these days, this last day, look at this. This is not a victorious, triumphant, vibrant, healthy, strong Christianity. It's pretty sick and weak. It says, verse 15, I know thy works, that thou art neither hot nor cold. Hot water is good for some things, and cold water is good for some things, but lukewarm water, you know, lukewarm. I actually, I think I said this before, lukewarm. I looked up, I was just curious what the temperature of lukewarm is. You can look it up. The temperature of lukewarm, 98.6. Body temperature. In other words, lukewarm simply means it's all done in the flesh. It's all done in human strength, ability, wisdom. It's not God. It's man. Modern Christianity, with its modern music, with its modern methods, with its modern buildings, with its modern Bibles, it's all man-made. It's all flesh. It's not Holy Ghost. It's not Jesus Christ. It's man. Oh, they sing about him. They talk about him. But he's not the driving spirit behind it, and he's not the focus of it. If he was the focus of it, there'd be a lot less money spent on buildings and more money spent on getting the gospel to people. Amen. If he was a part of it, there'd be a lot less money and time spent on music and more money spent on teaching people the word of God. You can fill a theater with a Christian movie. You can fill a stadium with a Christian rock band. But you can't get believers to come to a church and open their Bible and study the Word of God and take the gospel to their neighbors. So music and movies, I mean, that's, that's where people's appetites are today. But to actually soldier up, to actually be fit for battle? No, not today. Not the Laodicean church. It's... It says uh, they're lukewarm. It's all human. It's all fleshly. 98.6. Notice how God feels about it. Because thou art lukewarm, verse 16, I'll spew thee out of my mouth. In other words, that's the kind of Christianity that makes God sick, makes him vomit. Makes him vomit. It's not talking about you being spit out of Christ. It's not talking about your salvation. It's not talking about losing your salvation. It's talking about the Lord's reaction to that kind of a church. I'll spew thee out of my mouth. In other words, he's talking about hot, cold versus lukewarm. Because, verse 17, because thou sayest I am rich and increased with goods. Christianity is very wealthy in these last days. It's, it's, it's a lot of money. Most of the big preachers on the, on the internet and on television are all millionaires. And they live in homes... Their house alone, if we could just sell their house, it would finance missions for us for 20 years to come. And living in luxury, praying and asking others to give more money so that they can buy their private jets. It's insane. It really is insane. It's so insane. What's really insane is that they have thousands of followers and can preach to stadiums full of people and nobody knows enough Bible to... Expose these nitwits. And they sit there and say, oh. It's like, what is wrong with us? The Lord told us 2,000 years in advance what was wrong with us. Look at what he says down in verse number 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. The problem is he's on the outside. <laughs> Imagine. <laughs> when we have church, we always remind you, hey, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ is here with us in this place. Imagine if he was really out there knocking at the door. Hey, could I get in on whatever you guys are doing in there? Would it be all right if I joined whatever you're doing down there? No, he's on the outside of that kind of Christianity. That's the problem. He's not the heart of it. He's not the center of it. He's not the reason for it or the focus of it. He's on the outside. They're going on without him. They probably don't even know he left. He probably left the building and nobody even noticed. That's modern Christianity. It could go on without Jesus Christ. As long as you just pump up the volume, keep everybody moving, keep everybody shaking, 
Keep everybody happy. Give them something to entertain their kids. Have plenty of food in the mix. Everybody's fine. They don't even know that Jesus Christ left the building. He's on the outside knocking, trying to get back into his own church. That's the state of Christianity. You better understand the times that you're living in. Right. Them are the times that we're living in. That's why if you see us put a little more focus on some things here than maybe a typical church, it's why we do it. It's why we do it. None of those kind of things build Christians. None of those kind of things make soldiers. Struggle, resistance, sacrifice is what makes soldiers. It always has. No army has ever created a fighting force by coddling men, by making sure their men were comfortable, by making sure their men felt well about themselves, you know, that they had positive affirmation. I want to make sure that you feel good about yourself. What kind of a country could ever produce a fighting force like that? It would, it's never happened. But Christianity imagines that that can happen today. We're, we're idiots. We really are. Modern Christianity is idiotic. It lost its brains a long time ago. I don't know what happened. But, but the Lord nailed it here, man. He nailed it 2,000 years in advance. He told us exactly the way it was going to be. You have to understand. That's one thing about the times that you have to understand. You're living in spiritually compromised times. Now, having that understanding, what should you do about it? Get in your Bible. Keep your eyes on Jesus Christ. Stay as close to your commander as you possibly can. Now, that's an effort you have to make on a daily basis, a little bit at a time. You don't just wake up in the morning and all of a sudden you're closer to Jesus. You have to consciously, I want, I want to read a little more today than I did yesterday. I want to spend a little more time thinking about him. I want to find out if he would like a cup of water from Bethlehem, I think I'd like to do that. Figure out what the Lord would be happy with and then go do that. Would it be happy that you talk to your friends about Jesus Christ? Then go do that. Do you need us to schedule it for you? Do you need us to say, all right, tomorrow at 3 o'clock, we're going to all take the gospel to our neighbors. Do you need that? Well, praise the Lord, it's good to do it together, but I hope you don't need that. You can read between the lines, I think. You can see that this world is dying and men need Jesus Christ. You can see that some of your friends, your neighbors, the kids you go to school with or the people you work with, will never have a chance. Maybe I'll never have a chance to ever see them or meet them. You might be the only opportunity they'll ever have to hear about Jesus Christ. Why don't you take the initiative, knowing what your Savior would be happy with, why don't you take the initiative and talk to them? And if you're not bold enough to talk to them, grab a track back there. We won't even charge you for it. Grab a gospel track and just... Hand it to them. And if you're not bold enough to hand it to them, when they're not looking, leave it somewhere where they'll find it. There's a lot of ways you can do it until you work up the boldness to stand on a corner and preach the gospel. You can sneak it in. I knew a guy that went to the library and just stuck tracks in books. I don't recommend that. I'm not saying that. But I mean, hey, I don't think when he gets to heaven, the Lord's going to say, I really don't approve of that. You could find something to do. If you understand the times, right? If you understand the times, then you know what to do. If you don't understand the times, then you don't have a clue. Hey, I think that rhymes. Write that down, somebody. <laughs> if you understand the times, you'll know what to do. If you don't understand the times, you don't have a clue. All right. That's copyrighted now. All right. Anyway, uh, here's another one. Go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. This know all, verse 1, this know also that in the last days, uh, we're there, that's us, the very end of this church age, we're right there. It's been almost 2,000 years from the time of the cross. Jesus promised that he would come back after 2,000 years. What do you think about them apples? You can do the math. Say, well, we don't really know exactly when Jesus was crucified. All right, we can't nail it down to whether it was... 30 A.D., 31 A.D., 32 A.D., 33 A.D., but we're in the ballpark. And he was coming back, he said, after 2,000 years. We're, we're there almost right now. We're almost, and, and, and he made it so that we wouldn't know exactly the date or the time, but we know we're right there. We're right near the end. And now, with everything happening in the world, you, you, you have to be blind not to see that 
Everything is falling together exactly the way the Lord said it would. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 1, This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. What would be so perilous about them? Here it is. It's spiritual peril. It's a, it's a, it's a, a time when men have no spiritual discernment. They don't understand. We're living in a world when people don't even understand good from evil anymore. They call things that are evil, they call that good. And they call good evil. There's no spiritual discernment. There's no, there's no, there's no standard to judge. Today, men don't have a standard. We know we have a standard. We have a Bible. But the world today, you know, threw the Bible out a long time ago, out of our schools, out of our, you know, out of, out of life, out of our lives, out of public discourse, you know, out of the marketplace, everywhere. The Bible is a rejected book. But here are the words of life. Here's the future and, and revealed to us. But once you throw this away, okay, then it's just every man does that which is right in his own eyes. So they can't really tell today good from evil, right from wrong. I know in basic things they know it's probably wrong if they kill somebody. But nowadays, that's not even wrong if it's in, for, for a good cause. you got people that feel it's okay if I murder that person because I don't like his politics. I don't like... I don't, I don't like I don't like his race. I don't like his religion. He should die. Perilous times. Look at verse 2. For men shall be lovers of their own selves. Wow. Somebody says, well, this is an old book. This is just an antiquated, outdated book. Really? Wow. It, it's, got, it's pretty much right on the money here. Lovers of their own selves, covetous, always wanting more, not content with what they have, never satisfied, not learning to be satisfied with what you have. I don't know about you, when I grew up, I had a stick and a rock to play with. You know what, if somebody broke my stick, I just went and got another one, because there were thousands of them out there. In the, in the, in the, and you pile the rocks up and you make roads between them. Cardboard box. Do you know how many things I built with a cardboard box? An old refrigerator box. It was a rocket ship. It was a factory. It was a garage. It was, it was everything. Today, your kids aren't happy unless they've got a $900 phone and a $2,000 game set and the best headphones and a widescreen 4K, whatever that stuff is. Nobody's happy. Nobody's satisfied. It's never enough. And that's not the kids' fault. That's it. Come on, Sid. It's not your kids' fault. Right. It's your fault. That's right. It's your fault. Because you think if you give them more, they'll like you more. Yeah. <laughs> you want to be their friend instead of their parent. That's right. That's right. You don't understand the times. The Bible told you that in these times, the spirit of covetousness would be so strong. So what should you do? Resist that. Don't give in to that desire, that lust of your eyes or the lust of your children's eyes. I want this. I want that. Mommy, I need this. You ever been in a supermarket and seen a kid throw a tantrum because his mother wouldn't get him whatever it was that he wanted at that moment? And if she did get it to him, get it for him, he's probably broken by the time he gets to the parking lot and he's moved on to something else. Why are, you know what that is? That's people not understanding the spirit of the times that we live in. If I know, the t understand the times, then I know what to do. I know what to do. Lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents. Wow. I think they teach that now in elementary school. There must be a class in disobedience to parents or, and disobedience to the authorities. Unthankful. Unholy, without natural affection. Just saw yesterday, read about a woman that killed her three kids. And that seems to be not really that rare now. The other woman that killed her children and buried them in her boyfriend's backyard or something like that. Natural affection. Even an unsafe person has some natural affection. It's in a woman to love her children. That's natural. It's normal. 
You don't have to be a born-again Christian to love your children. But even natural affection seems to be gone. Without natural affection. Truce breakers. In other words, lie to your face. Promise to do this, but lie to your face. They know as soon as you turn your back, they're going to do something different. Truce breakers. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. But notice, plenty of religion, lots of religion. we got plenty of religion today. Having a form of godliness, that's religion. But denying the power thereof, that's the gospel. Religion without the truth of the gospel. And God says, that's perilous. And that's the times we live in. Do you understand the times? Do you know what's going on? If you know what's going on, then you know the value of a church that teaches sound doctrine. You know the value of, of, a, of a group of believers where the word of God is elevated, is preeminent over the opinions of its leaders. I'm as dumb as a rock, and I'll, I'll be happy to admit that. Half the time, I don't even know what we should do. But as I read my Bible, things get a little clearer. And as we sit and talk about things, we, we kind of know what direction this church should go in as... But the scriptures have preeminence over our opinions. We're trying to be true to what the word of God says. Trying to see the mind of Jesus Christ here in the scriptures. These are the times. You and I are supposed to be aware of this. Having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Look at verse 6. For of this sort, people with all those kind of problems, of this sort are they which creep into houses. It's not talking about burglars. Remember, in this day, all the churches were in houses. They didn't start building church buildings until the 3rd or 4th century. That was Catholicism that began that. I'm thankful for a room big enough. I don't think I could get you guys all in my living room. So we do have to gather somewhere. But we're happy that it's a warehouse down by the railroad tracks. But when believers in the early days, they met in houses... In Jerusalem, even though there were 5,000 people in the church of Jerusalem, they, they met in houses. They gathered and the, the apostles went like circuit-riding preachers from house to house, breaking bread, preaching and teaching. We may end up back in those. We may end up having to reproduce that. We're okay with that. We've already talked about this with the deacons. If things got to that point, we just sell everything here and we start meeting in our houses. would not be a big deal. But... Lord, but notice that the Lord is telling you that in the last days, this is something you should understand. There'll be those who creep into houses, creep into churches with that kind of a spirit. Covetous, no respect for authority, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. What, what, how, why are they a peril? Because they're infectious. It's infectious when someone like that creeps in, creeps into a church. Notice who's usually first affected by it. Lead captive, silly women. Silly doesn't mean toodles. The Bible calls, the Lord called the tribe of Ephraim a silly dove. Meaning, flitting from this to that, to this, to this, to this, to this. Not serious, not sober-minded, silly, frivolous. Not concerned about anything of eternal consequence, just now, today. Something, you know, for today. The color of the carpet. Stupid stuff. That's silly. It's silly for us to be worrying and arguing about any of those things. You don't like the blue carpeting? You want to make it green? I don't care. I don't care. You want to sit on benches instead of these nice, comfortable chairs? I don't care. We're not going to fight about stuff like that here. That's silly. So you see the times. You have to understand the times. So what should I do about that? Well, I should appreciate biblical leadership. I should appreciate sound doctrine. I should appreciate the importance of a local church family that's knit together in love. I should be vigilant about that kind of a person or that kind of a spirit that comes in here. You know what you should do if somebody comes up to you one day? Hey, did you hear about? Do you know that the person that spreads that and the person that stands still to listen to it in the Bible are equally guilty. Amen. Woe to you if you're the person that does that. 
did you hear about, well, I don't like the way they did this. They should have done it this way. You know, nobody called me. Nobody asked me. They did it without talking to me. You know, but, you know, we didn't do it that way in the past. We should have, you know, that person who says that, you know what they need? They need an ear to spew that stuff into. If you give them the ear, you're as guilty as they are. That's what the Bible says. Both were punished in the Scriptures. Somebody comes up to you and they've got something negative, something critical, some gossip to share with you right then and there. I love what they do in Mexico. When you try to give them a track, they have this thing. I thought they were giving me the finger. It wasn't. In, in Mexico, when you give somebody the track and they don't want it, they're trying to be polite, they go... They put their hand up in front of their face. The first time somebody did that to me, I was like, What? All right, uh, all right, now, now, all right buddy, come on. Now, now we're going to have a problem. And then another guy did it. And then another guy. And a little old grandma did it. And everybody's, you know... You just go like this. That means, no thank you. No thank you. You know the next time somebody, their lips begin to speak, and after that second word, you already know what's coming out of them? And while you're at it, just do one of these, too. Like, just, just go. Just, but just go, you know, no thank you. No thank you. No thank you. You know what? It stops it right there. All right, we having fun yet? All right, okay. All right, okay, all right. Well, I can see right now, we're about halfway done. And I'm out of time. Wow, okay. All right, let's, um, all right, I'm not going to, all right, let's just, uh, all right, let's go here. We'll just try and wrap it up after this one, all right? Second Timothy chapter 4. I wanted to take you, and I, I think I will, I'll save it. I want to go into Matthew chapter 24, which then it gets into prophecy and doctrine and the events that are actually happening and what do they mean? Is this the Ezekiel 38 war? Or is this Psalm 83 war or whatever it is? And I've been, I haven't had much sleep this week, so if I'm a little crazy, my wife can explain to you that's why this, this stuff has just been, but I'm not, we don't have time and we don't have time to just give you all this. I'll give it to you in the next message. But let's, let's just, let's just, Wrap it up with this, 2 Timothy chapter 4. We're talking about understanding the times. Know what's going on. If you don't know what's going on, then you don't know how to lead your family. You don't know what to do. You're winging it. You're winging it. And hoping you're right. You're just winging it. But if you understand the times, then you're going to know, you're going to know what to do. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom. Two different comings mentioned there. His appearing, there's the rapture. His kingdom, there's the second advent. So it's important to see that the Lord comes twice. All right, he's coming twice. Coming once to get us and take us out of here, and then all hell breaks loose. And then he comes back with us at his kingdom to establish his kingdom. And that's the second part of that. All right. It says, preach the word. Preach the word. Hmm. It's pretty clear. What should you and I be doing? Preaching the word. Every opportunity we get, preach the word. You don't have to be ordained to preach the word. You don't need a Bible institute Education to preach the word. You don't even have to be an adult to preach the word. Some of our kids in here do a pretty good job of it. <laughs> do a really good job of it. And preaching is not what you think. It doesn't have to be an outline with a poem at the end. Somebody preached, one of our young men preached for the first time on the, at the train station last week. And he was scared to death. But um, I said, well... Listen, just read these verses. I gave him some verses to read. I said, don't say anything. Don't comment. Don't add anything to it. Just read it in your best voice, as loud as you can, so those people down there can hear it. And he did that. He read it, and then lo and behold, as soon as he read it, he started commenting. <laughs> he couldn't help himself. And he started talking about it, and then he came up with some other verses. I said, well, isn't that something? Isn't that something? No preparation in a sense. No, you know, didn't have to sit down in a corner in 30 minutes and make an outline. It's just a scripture verse. You speak it, and the Holy Ghost gives you something to say about it. That's all preaching is. Read or tell somebody a verse, and the Holy Spirit will give you something to say about it. And if the Holy Spirit doesn't give you anything to say about it, you did more probably good for that person than, than 
if you had tried to explain the verse. The scriptures are where the power is. The power is not in your explanation of the scriptures. The word of God is where the power is. The gospel is what the Lord uses to save those that believe. I'm going to try to explain it as best I can, but my explanation, God did not promise to bless my explanation. I want to get it right, but even if I can't get it right, just give the scripture verses. Just give the gospel. And you're preaching. So Paul tells Timothy, right? He already warned him in the previous chapter, in the last days, perilous times should come. All right, Timothy, what should you do? Preach. Preach the word. Be ready. Be instant. Instant means quick. Be prepared. Be ready. Be equipped. Don't think like, well, you know, eh, maybe when I get done with discipleship one, maybe or maybe discipleship two. No. Be ready. Be instant. Be prepared. Be willing that if a door opens right after church, on your way home, there's an opportunity. Be instant. In other words, hey, anybody got any tracks? <laughs> no. Maybe be prepared. You never know. Have some on you. Put some in your car. Be, be, be ready. Because maybe the Lord will open up an opportunity. There'll be somebody there. God will just put it in your heart. And you give somebody a gospel track. And you never know what may, be, may come of that. In Mexico, we went out. And all I did, you know, it wasn't... I just held up a scripture sign. Some guys were handing out tracks. Some guys were talking to people, having conversations. One guy was, was trying to preach and... And I just, that day, I just said, I'm going to hold a scripture sign. I just stood in the median. Bobby and uh, Eddie Keeley were going in between the cars that were stopped at the light, handing out tracts to people. And I was standing in the median, just holding up a scripture sign. And on one side, it said, Whosoever is not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. On the other side, it said, you know, something a little softer, a little gentler. And I happen to have the side that said, whosoever's not found written in the book of life was cast in the lake of fire. I'm holding the sign up. And I see this car with a couple of ladies in it. And they're stopped at the light. They can't go anywhere. They're looking at the sign. And I don't know, my gentle side. I felt bad, so I turned it around. I turned the side around. I'm holding the sign up, you know. I'm smiling at them. And the lady goes, well, okay. I turned it around. Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. She took her camera out and took a picture. Click. Of me holding a sign. I always love that. I love it. If you're out preaching or holding a sign or whatever you're doing, if somebody takes a picture of it, don't get offended. Because they're going to show, 10 more people are going to see that. All right? And they're going to talk about it. So that's good. Anybody takes a picture of me, even if they're doing it to mock me, I'll smile. Because <laughs> somebody else is going to see that. Anyway, one of, the other, one of the Mexican young men saw that and chased after her car, gave her a track. She came to church that night with her friend. And they came back two nights later to church in the park. And then they came back on Sunday with her husband and her kids and her grandkids. And now her and Margaret have started texting each other. Her name's Victoria. It turns out she was saved. And the lady in the car with her was a doctor. Both of them are coming to the church now there in Puebla. And they're excited. And she said, you know, there's a lot of people in this neighborhood that used to go to church. They don't go to church anymore. She's going to try and invite them all. And she has relatives on Staten Island and comes to Staten Island twice a year. So she said, well, I'll see you, when, I'll see you soon in First Bible Church. You know all I did? All I did? I just held up a scripture sign. That's all I did. Just held up a scripture sign. I didn't do anything. Just standing there enjoying the weather, holding up a scripture sign. But God can use that. Take a track. Hold up a scripture sign. Or at least if you're too shy to do anything, just go out with the people that are doing something. Go to the nursing home. So well, I don't know what to do. What if somebody wants to talk to me? Just sit there. Just sit there. Don't say a word. Just sit there and sing and look pleasant. And before long, the Lord might open up opportunities to use you. Little by little. You know, just baby steps if necessary. But listen, if I understand the times, then I got to do something. I got to know what to do. The world is falling apart right here in front of our eyes, and it's going to be on our doorstep before we know it. What should we be doing? Digging a hole? Maybe we'll just all find a cave to go live in. We can all go buy property in Montana. We'll just take the whole church up to Montana, and we'll hide out in the woods. No. By my God, I have run into a troop. By my God, I have leaped over a wall. I'd like to go toward the problem. I'd like to address it. I would like us as a church 
to take this opportunity, if anything else, let's ramp things up. Amen. Let's spend more money than we've ever spent in the history of our church on getting the gospel out. Let's spend. I'm not talking about new things for us around here. I don't think we're going to regret, regret standing in front of Jesus Christ one day and saying, Hey, Lord, I'm sorry, we went broke. We went broke buying tracts and Bibles to tell people about you. I'm sorry. It probably wasn't fiscally responsible, Lord. No, if you're spending it on you or I'm spending it on me, okay, yeah, you can talk to me about it. But I would like when Jesus Christ comes for us to be broke as a church. I'd like to use what we have for his sake, for his name, and spend more and do more. One night a week for public ministry, I would like to see us do six nights a week. I would like us to do more. I would like to be broke. I would like to spend everything we got on getting the gospel out while we have an opportunity. I'm asking you guys, Thursday night, be here, because that's what I want to talk about. We've got to figure out how we're going to do this. And I'll just say this. I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself, but I'll tell you this. Can I, can I take five more minutes? All right, I know it's late. I know you're, I, I'm sorry. I just want to say this. When I think back on the history of this church, every time we have ever spent for the gospel's sake, the Lord has blessed us financially afterwards. My very first year as pastor, we had Christmas offering. We don't celebrate Christmas around here. You can do whatever you want to do. We don't do that as a church anymore. But it was my first year. It was tradition. We always did it. Christmas offering. And the Christmas offering traditionally was always used for some capital improvement around the building. It was my first year as pastor. I was under a lot of stress. I was young. I already had ulcers. <laughs> and I didn't have everybody on my side at a deacon's meeting. So at our, first deacons, at our first thing to discuss this, everybody's saying, well, you know what, we need to fix this, we need to repair that, we need to do this, we need to do that. Everybody was kind of a consensus that our bathrooms at that time were disgustingly bad. They needed to be gutted and repaired. But I had recently learned about a guy in the Philippines. I'd never been to the Philippines, but I learned about a pastor over there who had a little Bible institute, 51 students, most of them from the jungle, very poor. Many of them didn't even have Bibles. And I got burdened about that. And I said, you know, I'd, I would like to buy all 51 of those guys a new Bible, a study Bible, and get them a concordance, and maybe get them a little handbook, something preachers need things to help them and study and reference books and things like that. Every preacher kind of has a library. You read things and you, you, you refer to them. And these guys had nothing. Some of them didn't even have a Bible. They were given loaners. They were given somebody else's Bible when they came into the Bible Institute. And I said, I'd like to get 51 Bibles, 51 concordances, 51 Bible handbooks. Oh, no, no, we can't do that. No, 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 no. Have you seen those bathrooms up there? Those are disgusting. You know, somebody comes in, the first thing they see is those bathrooms. Those are, those are so bad. No. Well, I learned a lesson early on. I stood my ground. I said, no, I, I, wanna, I want us to do this. So we collected, I don't know, 3,100, 3,200, something like that, right? And we bought Bibles. We bought everything we bought. The next day... I get a check in the mail for $25,000 with a little note. Fix up the bathrooms. <laughs> oh, is that how this works? That's how this thing works. Every time I spend for those who can never pay me back, God says, I'll pay you back. Amen. Now listen, that was... 1993, so I don't know how, what, whatever that is. Is that 40 years, 30 years ago? That's 30 years ago? I can't do math. Whatever that is, that's 30 years ago. So that's 30 years in this ministry for me. And from day one, that's been my, that, that's been my, my I've, I learned right at the beginning. That's how God works. Someone got an idea. It wasn't even my idea. Somebody came to me and said, you know what? Wouldn't it be great if we could just bring the gospel to every house on Staten Island? I'm like, wow, the light bulb went off in my head. Let's do it. Let's do it. That was the beginnings of Operation Jerusalem. We didn't have the money for that. We didn't have a printing ministry at the time. Those gospels of John at that time, like all those years ago, were 25 cents each. 
And then there was a little book that we put in there produced by Peter Ruckman, um, Millions Disappear. That was 18 cents each. Then we put a chick track in there. Everything all together, there was, at that time we figured about 150,000 homes on Staten Island, and we decided this is 1996. So I was the third year in the ministry, 1996. We decided we're going to cover the whole item. We're going to put the gospel. And, and four or five people said, well, how are we going to pay for this? What are we going to do? I don't know. I don't know. Well, let's do it. Let's just do it. We spent, in the three years that it took us to cover all those houses, $100,000. $100,000 25 years ago. You know what we got out of that? We got two people. As a result of that, two people came into our church. A young college student named Pat Mashanya, who was searching for the truth. That bag was hung on his doorknob. He came to faith in Jesus Christ, came into our church, married one of our young ladies, went through our Bible Institute and is now pastoring in New Jersey and got a great, thriving church over there. You know the other person we got from that effort, $100,000? An old-timer named John Scharenbeck. John Scharenbeck was a retired iron worker, never even finished high school, had been a drunk most of his life, but sobered up, wanted to do something for God, got one of those packets, decided to come to church with his wife, and in the... I don't know, 10 years that he was part of this church. He came in in like 1997 or 98. He passed away uh, almost 10 years ago, something like that. I don't remember the exact date. In the time that he was in, his, in this church, just a working guy probably gave this church $600,000. All for the gospel. The Lord taught me again. Hey, if you'll spend for me, I'll pay you back and heap it up over it for you. Now, we don't have time here because you're, you're, I know you're hungry, but I could keep going. There's more stories like that. And just last week, I came back from Mexico. My heart was burdened about these things. And I said, Lord, I, I, I've seen, our, I mean, at our last deacons meeting, I didn't even want to tell the guys, I didn't want to show them the financial statement. Hey, we don't spend much money on ourselves, but we, that printing ministry up there is very, very expensive. We give money away to our missionaries like it's water. A lot of money goes out of here for other people to get the gospel, to help people. And some of you in here have been the recipients of your rent paid, bills paid, things when you were in need. Amen. Our church has been that way. Amen. We give, we spend, and sometimes don't even look at the bank account. I don't, even know, I don't even know. But I came back from Mexico and I was just torn up about this and I was stirred up about this. Lord, I, I don't understand. Like, how, how are we going to do this? I, know what I, I think I know what we should do as a church. But I have no idea. That was Monday. We got back Monday night. Tuesday morning I came in. The mail was all piled up and I go through the mail. Guess what I found in the mail? Tuesday morning. A check from somebody who doesn't even go to this church who watches this on YouTube. A check for $50,000. With a little note telling us how much we've meant. And I want to use this for the, the printing ministry and the furtherance of the gospel. Once again, for about the ninth or tenth time in my ministry, the Lord says, look, if you'll spend it on getting the gospel to other people, I'll take care of you guys. Yes. We need to understand the times so we know what to do. But it takes a whole church full of people that understand the times, and we're all in this together, collectively. Yes. Pushing together, shoulder to shoulder. This is a joint effort. If you're in, then get in. Get in. Get in all the way. Don't sit on the sidelines. Get in and help us do this. Time is ticking. Clock is running out. We need to be about our Heavenly Father's business. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. <laughs> our Father, Lord God, I do thank you. I thank you for all that you've given us, Lord. We are... This whole 48 years of the history of this little congregation is nothing but miracle after miracle. I don't even understand it, Lord. It would be great if we could take credit for having been such smart planners. But, Lord, uh, it's never been anything like that. It's just been trying to do the things that pleased you and watching the blessings and the rewards come. And they don't always come in the form of some money. They just come in the form of people strengthened and rejoicing and serving. And I pray that would always be the mark of this church, men and women that love this book, love Jesus Christ, and would be willing 
to fight their way, Lord, through the enemy to get a cup of water for their commander. You said even a cup of water would be remembered if it was done for the right reason, done for you. And Lord, I pray that you just help us. Help us to understand the times we're living in. Help us to know what to do because of that. Help our men in this place to get serious about being fathers and husbands. Help the murmurers and the complainers to have repentance, Lord. I pray that you would rebuke that and, and, and cleanse our church of that. I'm sure, Lord, we've lost families, new families that might have been a part of this place, but somebody had a chip on their shoulder, somebody said the wrong thing, somebody had a bad attitude, some Sunday school teacher was unkind to their children, or, Lord God, please forgive us and help us. And I pray, Lord, that as we see that day approaching when you're coming for us, we think about it with great joy and a little bit of fear. Lord, a fear for ourselves and for the work here that we would be found faithful. I pray that we might be, Lord. I pray that we might not let you down. I pray that you'd give us grace. I pray that you'd strengthen our arms. I pray that you'd strengthen our hearts. I pray that you would make us fit for the battle. I pray that you'd help every man in this place to just, I pray you'd light a fire in each and every one of us, not just the men, but even our ladies. Light a fire in us, Lord. Light a fire in us, Lord, that we could we just uh, have a burden to tell others about Jesus Christ. Give us wisdom, Lord. Thank you for the men in this place. David would probably have never accomplished what he accomplished without all those incredible men around him, those mighty men around him. And this place would never be what it is, Lord, without the men and women that you've raised up in here. I thank you that I could be a part of it and be in the middle of it, Lord. It's a blessing. But now help us, Lord. Help us in the days ahead. It doesn't matter to us what tomorrow's news is going to bring. We've already read, read the news in the Bible. We already know what's coming. But Lord, help us to understand what's happening around us, connect the dots, and know what to do. And Lord, I pray that if there is someone here this morning that's not ready for eternity, they've never been saved, Lord, I pray that you'd help them before they leave this building, that they would seek someone out, myself or anyone else here, Lord, and, and ask that in question, that, that most important question of all, what must I do to be saved? And I pray, Lord, the Holy Spirit would give them the answer from the Word of God, help them that they might be saved today before they go home. Thank you for your word. Thank you, Lord, for the precious truths that you show us. So many things in the scriptures, Lord, we're still trying to figure out about the events around us, Lord. I pray you'd give us wisdom. And maybe we're not supposed to know those things. But, Lord, if, uh, if we can, uh, we want to, Lord. We want to understand these things. And I pray that you'd help us, Lord. Open our eyes that we might behold those wondrous things out of your word. I pray for the nursing home ministry to follow. I pray for the men and women that are going there to serve today. Bless them, Lord. Give them fruit for that labor, for your glory. Help them, Lord. And the ministries this week for Harvest Fest. A lot of visitors from the neighborhood come sometimes. We pray that someone might be drawn to the gospel through the, even the things that are done there, the fellowship that we can have. Pray for the Bible study Wednesday night, for the deacons meeting Thursday, for the... For, uh, the, the public ministry on Friday and Operation Jerusalem on Saturday. Lord, there's just so many things each day this week that we could help with in some way. And I pray that you just, just bless all of those endeavors, Lord, for your glory and honor. Pray you'd get our folks home safely today, Lord. Help somebody to think about what they've heard this morning. I pray it would have an effect, Lord. I pray it would, something would change. I pray that somebody's life might be a little bit different because of your word. And uh, strengthen us, Lord, and equip us, Lord, we pray. We love you and thank you and ask these things now in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. What you're reading here, you're going to see it happen in front of your eyes. You're going to see it happen.